let me just kick this off. Um, you're all photographers, right? Anyone not a photographer here? Okay, so we start from a common ground. Um, you all have a lot of gear, right? And you're all motivated to do interesting things with your cameras, right? Now what are you gonna do with your pictures? I think that's the next step. And I addressed that a little bit in my talk yesterday morning, and I would like to continue on that theme, picking up on what Annie talked about, and uh, you know, we just had a conversation with Flip and Sapna and Annie, and we would like to share those experiences with you. Uh, how can you focus your work in a way that makes it more meaningful for yourself, but especially for others? Shall we start that way? Uh, Flip, should we start with you? Because sure. you've, you've, you've been photographing whales your whole life. In fact, it's a family tradition by now because your father started that and you told a very emotional story yesterday. Uh, but you, know, you did phenomenal stories for National Geographic over the years. And then you started uh, giving more of your personal time to scientists. And I found that a really interesting evolution. And that is what's been a mainstay of your, of your time. So can you talk about that? And you, we, sure. you mentioned the concept of citizen science. Well, actually, I wanted to be a biologist as a kid. Uh, snakes and lizards, but still, you know, I wanted to be a biologist, and uh, my eighth grade teacher, science teacher, Albert Grennan, said, with my academic skills, uh, I should do something else. <laughs> and, and so really, National Geographic just got in the way of my scientific career for 27 years, but I was covering researchers, and from the very beginning, the first time I went out to cover a research story, my father had just done the film, the documentary, Gentle Giants of the Pacific, which was very nice, Save the Whales film, how wonderful and friendly whales were. And then I met the researchers, and they had all these other stories, including whales who are sometimes in battles, and there's all this other part of the story. And that idea of how you take that initial interest and, and get excited about the idea of what a whale is and want to see one, and then realize that's just a beginning of the story, and I can tell you right now, you're probably, if you're really, really excited about whales in the news and what's, what's in the popular culture, you're five or six years behind the cool stuff that people are learning about whales. And so after a bunch of geographic stories, finally I went with the guys that I had originally started with, and I'd learned in all this time, I wasn't giving them anything by coming and taking their picture. I wanted to tell their story and take something from them there had to be a relationship where we were working together to tell that story. And when I got a little ahead in the mid-90s, I went back to the first guy I worked with, Jim Darling, and said, can we go back and work together and do research and go back to Maui and uh, see if it works out? The first year we had like $10,000, we went for a month, we had five good days, we had a boat that blew up twice, and uh, I got one picture. That one picture is the logo picture for Whale Trust. But we came back, and now we've been doing it 27 years. I've been on 10 uh, peer-reviewed science pieces as part of the scientific project, and the idea that we can work together, tell a good story, and show it both in popular and scientific terms is the best stuff I've ever done, and I think it's a good thing to do. Okay. Oh, one, one other thing. Yeah. The best thing about yesterday and the best thing about coming down here is telling my father's story. My father's 95 years old. I interviewed him last year to think back to that whale he'd ridden on the back of and at the end dived down in 1963 and pulled the line off the whale. The whale swam away. And my dad could relive that story and at the end say, we did a good thing. My dad now is really awake for about two hours a day he was up at the right time. He saw the, the presentation yesterday, and I got news back that he really liked it, and that was great. So, Flip, let me pick up on what you just uh, shared with us and see if we can connect that a bit more with people's circumstances here. Because you know, uh, offering your photographic talent to researchers who are working with interesting animals is a great opportunity. Now, if you knock on the door of a whale researcher 
Yeah, you, know, you might get some resistance there because everybody wants to photograph whales. There's permits involved and we don't want to get into that. But there are loads of other opportunities. You know, in every community, in every metropolitan area, there is a science museum, a natural history museum. There are people working in community colleges who may not be working with whales, but they're working on other interesting stuff that is probably much closer by that is more relevant for something that you can say yes to. And then, as Flip said, you build a relationship with someone and you have no idea where that may lead. Flip, what do you want to say? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And, and citizen science, as we can't, all the people who'd like to come and partic participate with us, we don't have the resources to do that. But there's a thing called Happy Whale, happywhale.com. And if you're out on a boat and you see a whale and you see it, get a picture of its tail, even a not a very good picture, you can send it into Happy Whale and they'll tell you where else that whale's been seen, what they know about that whale, and you will have started a relationship with research. Cool. Perfect. Sapna, you have a different story to share with people, right? What would you like people to know about your background and what you do with your photography? Okay. Um, since uh, a lot of you may not have uh, heard my previous talks. I hope I'm not boring you by repeating my story. I often feel like I repeat myself a lot here. Um, I am a physician and a photographer, pursuing a dual career right now. Uh, I work part-time as a radiologist and part-time as a photographer and a workshop instructor. So when I was um, pursuing medicine, you know, there were times when it got quite stressful uh, during the training period. And often to escape that stress, I found myself in the outdoors, exploring, um, hiking, camping, doing, doing a lot of outdoor activities, and gravitated gradually towards photography through that. The more time I spent in the hospital, uh, the more I realized that the therapy that I was experiencing in the outdoors, being out in nature, was not really being reflected in what we were doing in the hospital. You know, people come to the hospital to get healed. And you want to create an ambiance of healing in the hospital. But what we were doing with the whitewashed walls and fluorescent lights was a very sterile, intimidating atmosphere. And, you know, I thought, why don't we display images of nature on the walls? Why don't we create a more holistic environment for healing? We have so many advances for healing the human body, but how come we are creating an atmosphere of fear when it comes to the mind? So I took this idea to the hospital board and I suggested, you know, the time I spend in nature is so therapeutic. Why don't we incorporate those images? So they said, okay, let's go ahead and start doing that. So I started with the hospital that I was working at, which was actually Kaiser Walnut Creek. And um, that's the first hospital that I started putting up the images on. You know, this was back in 2011, 2012, and I had just started in photography at that time, definitely an amateur, and I liked the fact that they bought the idea, I liked the fact that they did an entire hospital with just my images, but the first week after the images went up, I was devastated, because every mistake I had made in the photographs stared at me, now at an eight foot size. So I was cringing every time I walked past the images, and I secretly hoped none of my photographer friends would ever come to that hospital. <laughs> so as, uh, you know, we are perfectionists, right? So we look at the details. But in, in that week, I suddenly began to notice a change. I realized that others did not see the images the way I was seeing them. They just took the overall feeling from the image. They liked the fact that the walls were transformed they liked having something nice to look at. The patients appreciated the fact that they could have a temporary escape from their anxiety while waiting for the doctor to come in or for some test results. The pictures were also played on TV screens. And then I realized even the staff enjoyed coming to the hospital now because it was something really nice to look at. So after about a month, I began to accept that it's okay to have pictures that may not be perfect as long as the result from them is good. And that's kind of the message I have. When we're looking at what can we do with our photography that makes this world a better place, 
then I think it's important to start exploring how can we transcend what is just a personal hobby and an individual need to something that has a larger purpose, that reaches out and touches other individuals, that has a positive impact on others' lives. Because when we do that, our personal journey becomes that much more rewarding. So that's, that's the aspiration I have for all of us, that we make this world a better place, one image at a time. You know, sometimes we may just have to delete that image to make the world a better place. We've all been there, done that. But sort of, you know, you hope. You hope you're generating images that work. Um, and so far, it's been a very fruitful journey. For the past several years, I have been pursuing the dual career. But come summer of 2024, I turn into a full-time photographer. So looking forward to that. <clears throat> so thank you, Sapna. And um, the, you know, the health service that Chris and I use, the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, practices what, what you just preach. Uh, you know, there's two doctors you know, at PAMF who are really quite good photographers, and, um, and they've decked the walls of all the facilities there, and it makes a huge difference. It's just become a cheerful place. And you know, I've had similar conversations in the course of some of our workshops. Sometimes we uh, teach a session called Personal Vision that is aimed at um, distilling you know, gems from people's work, uh, photographers who've been accumulating tens of thousands of images, and they don't know what to do with them. And I recall a conversation that I had uh, during one of these sessions to inspire our participants to start thinking in that direction. Uh, you know, reach out to schools, reach out to nursing homes, and specifically, uh, I remember one lady who was doing lovely work, and she said, well, what can I do? And uh, I nudged her in the direction of uh, putting, uh, putting slideshows together and take them to nursing homes. Uh, they were not the kind of stories that an editorial publication would ever be interested in because it was too soft, too personal, and it's pretty competitive to break into any publication these days. But there are so many people who are yearning for opportunities to connect with the outside world on the basis of photography. So think of what Sapna just sh shared with us and then take it the next step. Are there schools, are there nursing homes, are there other places where people can't get out as much and what could you offer to them? And actually, if you think of it in those terms, uh, those audiences could actually uh, be a really good tryout for you to test a body of work, give it shape, get responses from the audiences before you take it to the next level. How about you, Annie? What would you like to share? Well, I, you know, I, I just spoke earlier, so I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I do believe that most of you probably underestimate yourselves. Most of you probably, you know, would love to publish in some way, certainly love to grow. And if you, if you think about it sort of on a community level, you can start that now. I mean, the kinds of things that Satna was talking about, Flip is working with scientists, I remember one of the first groups I worked with was Habitat for Humanity. Um, sometimes it can be just as simple as saying, I'd like to come and photograph what you do. Maybe you love cats and dogs. Maybe you want to work at a shelter and photograph cats and dogs that need a home. Maybe you, um, you, know, maybe you care very much about the environment. And so you look for a way or an organization that could really use a visual representation of what they're trying to either prevent or promote. Um, there, there are just so many needy and wonderful outlets. And I think what usually happens is we throw a roadblock in front of ourselves. Oh, I can't do that because I'm not good enough, because I'm not experienced enough, because, you know, and, and the truth is, Remember that, th that the work you do is needed and necessary. And 
if, if you've ever just walked into a building and seen one of your photographs on a wall, it's just, it's just as thrilling as seeing it in a museum or seeing it in a magazine or seeing it, it's better than online really. So don't, don't put roadblocks up and instead try to look inside and go, what do I really love? You know, what is it that I have to give? And, and then take that and think creatively rather than literally. So I love chemistry. Well, what am I gonna do with chemistry? You know, you can, you can light up a chemistry lab with, with images. You can, there are just so many things where you are needed. And, and that's when you leave kind of the private world of just, I love to go into the woods and photograph flowers or something, and you, you start thinking beyond yourself and you honor your craft. And it gets you out the door and then you grow and grow and grow. So that's, that's what I believe. Flip, are you thinking to add on to anything that Sapna or Annie have said? Well, I, I was just thinking the, the, the idea of dealing with other people. And if, I think of when I worked in, you know, for over 10 years in the Arctic, and we go for months at a time with a guide, with a, a, trying to do a targeted picture. And if we went out for 60 days, you had three good days. And the rest of the time, you were waiting for those three good days. And now I go out 60 days to do research. And we still get three good days, but we're doing scientific recordings, we're doing IDs, we're doing all kinds of other cool stuff to go along. And when those three good days come along, you still take the pictures, but you're doing a lot more and you're working with, with uh, spreading the word to a lot more people. Okay. One thing that, that we did at my nonprofit, um, which is called Ripple Effect Images, um, one of the things we did that was so simple and so satisfying, and you guys could all do this, we went to a Syrian refugee camp in Jordan, and we, we photographed every family that wanted to be photographed. And many of these people had absolutely no pictures. You know, they had fled their homeland, and a lot of them, you know, never had many pictures to begin with. And we simply photographed these families, anybody who wanted to, and then we gave them their image in a, a lovely little folder so that it, it felt like a real gift. And I'm telling you, the impact that had, and you guys can do that too. You can photograph families who lost their homes in fires. You can photograph refugees. You can, you know, you can find a way to give back, and I promise you, you're gonna get more than you give. But just think out of the box and, and work with organizations that can connect you to the people who need you. Okay, uh, a couple of thoughts come to mind just hearing you uh, talk about this. You know, one other possibility is to uh, team up with others other photographers, that is, for the purpose of covering a project. You, know, you may not want to do certain kinds of photography, but you, know, you may know someone else who can cover in for that. And that uh, gives you a broader approach. It gives you a chance to motivate each other. And that can go even further when you start a conversation with the people and the organizations that may be interested in the, in the results of your work. One thing that every researcher, one thing that every activist needs is materials for presentations. Uh, no matter whether it is for fundraising or whether it is for any other kinds of community event. Um, ask them to share their existing slideshow with you and you as a photographer will, within a matter of a minute, see, okay, that is what they've got. Well, that doesn't look so great. Uh, we can do better than that. Uh, in the course of that same conversation, you can ask them, kind of, what is it that you would like to visualize that you do not have in hand at the moment? 
And that way you start the conversation and basically you come up with the classic shop list. I see Flip already nodding his head. I know that Andy thinks that way too. And that way a, a concept turns into a, you know, a very specific project list. Um, I heard Andy refer to um, uh, animal care facilities. You know, for those of us interested in wildlife, uh, environmental issues, that could be a great focal point because you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of needs there. And you can see how that could go from a point of initial contact where an animal gets picked up, gets nurtured back, gets adopted, gets released again. Those could be really powerful stories. And that'll really force you to not just look at animals, but also at the essential interactions between animals and people. It's gonna force you to deal with how you photograph things in confined circumstances, which will become a real education for you because things may not necessarily look so pretty. So those are just some initial thoughts from what I hear you say. Sampna, you mentioned something interesting backstage. Yeah. You became aware of the different psychological effects of certain colors and certain patterns. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, I, I do want to talk about the mental aspects of it. You know how we talk about getting into a creative rut sometimes. Sometimes we feel very anxious because there are others who are performing better than us <coughs> in the field of photography and you, you have this fear of missing out, <coughs> the FOMO effect. Or, you know, you're looking at social media and realizing, oh, my God, this person is doing all this stuff, and here I am investing all this time and energy, and I'm not really progressing in the field of photography, right? So how do we take that and flip it to positivity? No matter where you are in the journey of photography, there is always someone who knows less than what you know and who is less talented and skilled as you are, and there will always be people who are more talented and more skilled than you are, right? So instead of comparing ourselves to someone who is doing better than us and beating ourselves down and saying, oh my God, I'm not performing at that level, what if we were to lend a helping hand to someone else who's not performing at our level and say, let me impart whatever knowledge and skill I have. Let me share that. Let me make them feel better. I promise you the latter approach will be much more rewarding. You know, it's one thing to try to gain popularity on social media, but if you want to really feel positivity in photography, then it's true connections that you make to other individuals with the aim of wanting to help them, you know? So it, it, I'm talking about community over competition. And as photographers, I think each one of us has that individual responsibility to create a community where we foster care for others. It's not like we're trying to cut into the same slice of pie and therefore we have to be aggressive about it. I think we can change that culture. Um, and especially as we move towards more professional aspects of photography, I think we need to bring that professionalism. Um, something to think about when we're thinking of how we can make this world a better place through our imagery. And the other thing I wanted to talk about is what Franz uh, brought up about, you know how when you're out there in the field and you're experiencing absolute bliss, like you go there and the weather is crappy, but you hope for something nice to happen, you arrive there, it's still crappy, but you refuse to go back and you... You know, you're thinking through your head, why couldn't I pursue studio photography? You know, why the hell am I here in this crappy weather while everybody else is nice and, you know, cuddling? I go to Hawaii and I'm standing in the, you know, by the ocean you know, early in the morning and getting lashed by the waves. And my friends I know are sleeping and will be drinking their Mai Tais later on, right? And you, and you question yourself, why did I choose this? We do it because when conditions do come the way we planned, you know, once in a while, we enter the state of flow. We find absolute bliss when all our expectations are rewarded. Doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it is so deeply rewarding that we become addicted to that state of bliss. It's called finding the flow, 
right? We practice meditation specifically to achieve moments of bliss where we find flow. How lucky are we as photographers that we have found an avenue that leads us into those moments of bliss on a repeated basis? What a fortunate life we have. If we have discovered that, and if we have experienced that flow, what could be better than to teach someone else to find their own moments of flow, to show them how they can also have a blissful life? And that's where I think the educational component and sharing your knowledge and sharing the information comes, um, com becomes very important. So spreading that joy, you know, um, I'm sure a lot of you have shot horsetail falls, right? The very first time you did horsetail falls, think of that excitement you had. And then we go back year after year after year. I swear to God, everybody's picture of horsetail falls looks exactly the same. Yet we keep going back, right? And people ask me, Sapna, aren't you, like, don't you have enough pictures of it? Don't you feel bored? Don't you feel like you're crowded? There's hundreds or thousands of people over there, and they're crowding your space. I don't, because when I stand there and the horse tail falls goes off and everybody starts cheering like their favorite team won, what a wonderful thing to celebrate, right? Then you forget about the crowds and you forget about, you know, having to park two miles away and walk to the spot that you want to shoot. Instead, you remember what Galen Rowell did and Ansel Adams did when they inspired us with these images and you realize you're sharing that joy with everyone else. I would much rather stand at the base of Horsetail Falls, surrounded by a whole bunch of people, than watch a football game. That's just me. <laughs> so. Thank you, Sabna. Um, Annie, I was struck when you showed your, your, your photos of, of women and girls earlier this morning, that every image is, just expresses humanity and it expresses intimacy, and you have a rare gift to get into people's lives. And uh, I remember you saying, well, it's really easy to know when uh, you can take a picture of someone, because if they turn away, if they you know, signal uh, through gestures that y they don't want you in their lives, but of course there's more to it. Can you give us some insights that are relevant for people here, no matter whether they intend to travel or whether they go into community projects? What, what is your advice? How, how do you establish the rapport, first of all, because that's the first step, right, to be accepted? But then often, in my experience, yet when you, when you see something in your mind's eye that you would like to accomplish, but the situation can be improved a little bit. How do you go about asking someone, could you do this? Could you change your position? How do you go about that? Well, you know, basically photographing people is all about trust. And so you want to do anything you can to earn that trust. So for example, I mean, I, I don't have a camera bag. I just have a little backpack. I want to look like somebody's cousin or her mother or something. And, um, and then I'll demonstrate, for example, for you, you guys who are shy about photographing people. So let's say I'm going to photograph Franz, right? He's right here. And he, he doesn't know that I'm here. And he's just eating an ice cream cone. And it's kind of cute, because it's about to dribble down and everything. So do I go over and go, excuse me, Franz, can I take a picture of you eating your ice cream cone? No, because then you've just wrecked the moment. But if I'm over here, and I start shooting, and then he looks over and sees me, if I go like this, or like this, or like this, that is gonna, that's going to say, I'm not trustworthy. If I go like this, and I don't mind making an idiot out of myself, he's going to go, well, that idiot is taking a picture of me, and I guess it's OK, because she seems harmless. And, but it goes from there. But I, I think the, the most important thing is you look people in the eye. After you've got the picture, you go spend a little time with them. And that is what leads to the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. So because I'm a journalist, I go in 
actually hoping they'll invite me home. You know, you guys want to get a real photograph, but I want to go deeper because I'm, I'm telling a story. So in many situations, my hope is that we'll become pals and, and I'll learn about him and he'll learn about me. And even if we don't have language, we'll go, oh, great jacket. You know, love your earrings. Anything that does a personal connection, it's really fun. You know, it's, and you realize that most people aren't used to having anybody pay attention to them. So they're, at first they might be a little shy or awkward, but pretty soon they're like, this is pretty fun. And you'll be, you'll be the same way. So it's that. And then um, the other thing I would say is it's so tempting to go to the place everybody else goes to and to tell the story everybody else tells. But what is really satisfying is to find the stories that need to be told and that everybody isn't covering and that you can find access to people, real people, who, who matter. So does that answer your question? Okay. It does. Um, I would like to turn things over to, to you in the audience to ask if you have any questions or comments about things so far. Who would like to say something or ask something of any of us? Yes. The question is, um, if you couldn't hear, um, when do you need to get permission or a release or something like that? Um, the truth is, you know, certain publications and would like you to have a release for everyone, including your children, you know, um, because someday maybe possibly. I, I rarely get releases. I, I form a relationship and I make darn sure that my images are never used to embarrass them, hurt them. I mean, that's, that's what the basis of a lawsuit, or that they're not used in an ad campaign. Then, then you do need a release, you know, and you need to compensate people. But um, it's, it's really not a big issue, for me at least. And I don't want them to think that actually I've invested this time because I want to make money off of you. Yeah. Um, I would like to, thanks for that question, because I know more photographers are concerned about that. I think the first threshold is if, if you think you're doing this just for your own private use, no worries. You know, the last thing you should do when you enter into somebody's personal space is to pull out a legal agreement <laughs> because that doesn't create trust, right? So the second threshold is use for educational purposes. Um, and that is really what, what most of Andy's work is all about. And if you add in the caveats about making sure that people are represented in a way that is trustworthy, honorable, et cetera, you're not gonna run into problems. The big threshold, the big trigger is commercial applications. You know, that is where, you know, if you give the images to third party, you know, where there's a, a, a financial exchange, you know, that is where you need to be very, very careful. Yeah? Um, any other questions, comments? Yes. How do you handle people stealing your images? Okay, how do you how do you deal with people? Uh, I would call it appropriating your your images. Um, um, entirely different question, and uh, in this day and age of of rampant appropriation via uh, via the internet via social media, it is very difficult to control that in every uh, in every instance. There's companies now that specialize in uh, patrolling the internet, and if you give them a set of images, they can patrol the internet and find any and all applications, and then 
uh, they can act on your behalf and contact the uh, users and find out if things have been done inappropriately. Um, and ultimately that could lead to, you know, to legal fees and so on. Um, I think for most people sitting here, that's, uh, it leads you down a rabbit hole. And if you don't depend on your photography for your livelihood, it could really add a, a, a level of anxiety and, and worries to what you're really doing because you, it pleases you. It makes you feel good about creating images. So I would not worry about that too much. However, if there's specific instances where you feel somebody really stole an image, you know, there are some resources out there. Do you have anything to yeah. say about that? So I think when you post, right, I mean, most, you're talking about online stealing because, I mean, prints, they can't really steal, right, because we have them in a secure place. So my advice would be don't post anything at high resolution. You really don't because um, whether it's Flickr or Facebook or wherever it is that you're posting, anyway, that algorithm is going to make your images look only so good, right? It's crappy, the resolution. So don't ever be out there on social media or any kind of online platform with high resolution images. 1080 is all you should be posting. I post at 2000, even that I think is overkill. Um, just stick to 280, so that's one thing. The second thing is when somebody, when you realize, this happened to me where uh, I took a picture of my friend in the desert with her camera bag and a company from India actually stole the picture and published it on their main magazine, Better Photography. The cover actually had that. It was a stolen picture. And what happened was others congratulated me for getting a cover photo that I did not know about. So I looked at it and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. First of all, it was a commercial. It was an advertisement for a bag and that wasn't the bag the girl was wearing. <laughs> She was out there in the desert, it was far, you couldn't tell, but it was a great shot. So I was like, okay, so they're using the wrong product. Two, they don't have my permission. Three, they don't have my friend's permission to have the picture. So a lot of things had gone wrong. Um, in this particular instance, when I reached out to the magazine and said, what you published is wrong, they said, sorry, for the next three months, the contract has already been sold. So you'll see the picture again and again and again on the back cover, and no, you're not getting reimbursed for it. So I had to make what I did is made a big mess out of it on social media. I just posted it and said, don't buy this bag because they're not selling the right bag. <laughs> you know, um, so I reached out that way and everybody thought it was funny. So they started sharing it. And I reached out to the original cam camera bag company and said, what you're doing is unethical and I'll keep posting this and making jokes about it unless you take it down. So there's a way to go about it without, I guess, getting too anxious about it. But here, I would say send a cease and desist letter if they're using your uh, product. Usually, if it's a brand that's using it, you will get your money back because, you know, brands are careful. Um, it was a genuine mistake because it was a middleman who had sold the picture to them, so they didn't know it was mine. So if it's a brand, send a cease and desist letter, make them aware that this is happening. There are companies out there which will search the Internet, like do a reverse search, and they will find out where your images are and try to compensate you for that. My friends in Europe have much better luck collecting than we do in America or Asia. Um, and I think if it's an individual who is stealing it, guys, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, <laughs> right? That's a compliment. Take it. Say thank you. You must really love my images now that you're stealing them and let it be. You know, it's one yeah, individual I, don't, who... Don't you who, think it's yeah. mostly... <clears throat> d think about where you want to put your time and energy. You know, it, it's kind of karmic. <clears throat> um, you know, of course, I've seen Im my images used without permission and stuff, but it's not where I want my energy to go. So unless it's egregious, don't worry about it. Honestly, it just... That's, how, that's my belief system. I have to share a funny story. I took a picture of my um, daughter's friend. You know, she was trying to become sort of like this teenage model. And so I took her picture. And uh, when I was in the hospital, the hospital said, Sapna, can we use all your images 
uh, to just, you know, live in up the atmosphere. And I said, yeah, sure, feel free. Dig into any of my pictures and you can use them. The next thing I know, I'm walking through the mental health clinic and I see a picture of my daughter's friend saying, if you are depressed, <laughs> you know, she was trying to strike the model pose where they don't smile and sort of have that sour look. And they used that and said, if you are <clears throat> depressed, this is what you need to do. At that point, I had to put my foot down and said, please take that picture down. <laughs> so, you know, it happened. All right. Um, um, yes. Last question? Yep. Okay. Your question is, if you're interested in uh, making your work available, uh, to conservation organizations or educational entities? Uh, how do you bring possible compensation into the conversation about that? Um, you know, the, the budgets of most of the entities that you might be interested in supporting are really limited. And they're really not used to paying for the use of pictures. I hate to say that, but that's just the reality. And that's not just uh, small organizations. It includes you know, worldwide conservation organizations with budgets of hundreds of millions of dollars because the people who are in a position to say yes to the use of your images are under duress not to spend anything at all because you know, they'll get their pictures from their partners, from their scientists, et cetera, et cetera. They want the money to be spent on programs not on image acquisition. I will say before we finish this that um, uh, if any of you are interested in having us look at a body of work that you think has got some gems in it or you're searching for possible applications, uh, you know, we'd be happy to uh, bring you into one of these, these workshop sessions where we do that explicitly. And uh, with a small group of people, you'll be amazed to see how much camaraderie uh, you can develop in the course of a weekend. And it's not just your applications, but those of others as well that'll, um, that'll inspire you to carry on. So uh, just let us know. Go to Talia outside at our table if you're interested in that. Uh, then can I say one thing, Franz? Yeah. Because um, I, really I really want to finish on a high note. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Annie. <laughs> yeah. Not, not your workshops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> His workshops are really good. Yeah. Um, but the questions bother me a little bit because I think what, what we all believe and want to say is you should be each other's best friends. You know, photographers need each other and the world needs our work. And so try not to expend too much energy on what bad thing might happen. You have to have the basic knowledge and the ability to know who really can afford to pay and who can't. But more importantly, what I think we would like you to take away from this is that um, follow your heart. You know, be sure in your in your career or your just your photo life, that as well as growing personally, you learn how to give back to your community. And it will bring you tremendous, tremendous pride and it will make a difference. Annie, thank you for bending it back because we went into some rabbit holes. And uh, I see Flip Knott here. Flip, a last concluding statement because I think you have something on your mind. Or in your heart. And it, and it addresses what we were just talking about. If you're taking pictures, you want to show them to people. And, and people want to see your pictures. The senior centers, anywhere, if you're taking pictures and just looking at them yourselves, you're not doing much. Find some way to share the pictures with people, to get input from them. And that's when you do that, someone goes, hey, can't you come over here and do this? But show your pictures somewhere. There's, there, whether it's in a school, whether it's in a senior center, figure some way to share what you're doing with other people. Okay, how's that for a closure? If you end up doing something that comes out of this session, please share the results with us and we'll cheer you up. Thank you very much. Thank you.